thank you for having us. Uh, I'm Guido Pusiol. I've been working with Pablo Jacob. We're both uh, postdoc students at Stanford University. I come from computer science. Pablo comes from neuroscience. And we want to share with you our technology and our vision on home care uh, monitoring. Our goal is to help people to live independently for longer periods of time. And to do that, we plan to extract information analyze it and provide it. This information has to do with uh, daily activity. Both parties can benefit of our system, uh, elders and caregivers. For caregivers, knowing more about uh, someone can enable other type of interaction that goes beyond the policing questions about if you take your pill yesterday. Also, having quick access to information can allow to have a rapid response in case of injuries, for instance. On the other side, for elders, having feedback of the system about their own health can help them to stay motivated and improving themselves. Our system uses cameras, static cameras, installed in a facility. This can be a house or a hospital. And we have a software that runs in any normal computer on site that we understand the labels of the ongoing activities in each camera. That way, we can produce a log of labels of those activities. Like, for instance, at 8 a.m., a uh, person was having breakfast, and at 9, there was a fall detected. It is very important to talk about privacy, and we're very strict about that. In our case, there are no video storage, and there's no video transmission. Only the labels are going to uh, leave the house. These labels are going to go to the cloud service, and from the cloud service, a set of statistics and alarms are going to be triggered to the mobile devices of the responsible people. There, for instance, if an alert arrives saying a fall was detected, the caregiver can be reactive in a very short time. But that's not it. We can also analyze risk in long-term activities. Like, for instance, if someone starts taking food with a lot of salt, well, the caregiver can be proactive and prevent something bad to happen. But we can also, with the same system, take out the caregiver out of the loop, as I said before. And message can be sent to the elder uh, himself saying, oh, you ate great this week. Well done. And this type of systems have been proved in sports tracking uh, applications that helps to improve yourself and keeping track of these health situations. So why is this possible today and was not possible before? It's because uh, in the recent uh, couple of months, actually one year and a half, there has been a revolution in computer vision uh, where the, the, the advances in machine learning and using big amount of data to train models allows us to give to the computers the power of seeing. So we can see, we can say that we are in a time where computers are able to see. So of the many things that you can do with a computer that sees, we have been we have tried to be vertical, and we're going to show you today two user cases. One has to do with food intake, and the other thing uh, has to do with the normal abnormal activities at home, how we detect them. So in the next three slides, you're going to see videos with the real results of our system. I want you to pay particular attention to the top left side of the videos, and there you will see labels. This is not Photoshop or nothing. This is the real result of uh, our software. You will see that the labels are ordered top down depending on how certain the system is of recognizing that label at that instance of time. You also will see a green bar that represents this accuracy. So in the first video. This is me. This is me last week. I thought you would, we, we tested this. This is me last weekend trying to prepare a fruit salad. I'm a very bad cooker. So there you see that the system is detecting the different fruits that come into the table. This is how you can configure with your own camera um, the setting at your place, just pointing at the table. And we'll be recognizing which are uh, the, the different food appearing there. These labels, and not the video, the video is just showing, are the only ones that go to the cloud. The cloud recognizes this combination of labels appearing in the table and says that on, at this instance of time, uh, this person was preparing this food. Just to show you what, how strong the algorithm is, we download the video from YouTube because you can say, okay, they configured it for their own uh, purpose. No. 
This video was put into the algorithm, and the algorithm is recognizing the food with different changes of poses, different distances to the food, etc. So it's very robust. Uh, since we want to do a real live presentation with a webcam here, we cannot do it for the sake of time. We invite you to go to the webpage objectspot.com. It's our webpage. You can drag and drop your own images, and then you will see the labels that the algorithm is putting. Another uh, application, another, mm, I, I passed the slide here, but it's not passing. I'm sorry. Uh, another type of example is uh, for the daily activity. We can recognize the normal activities that make yourself functional at home and also the abnormal ones. This is with a lot of algorithms of machine learning. Uh, the, there you have it. At the top left, you have the results of the algorithm. It's uh, understanding that there are two people and each one uh, is doing something. The algorithm has no problem to treat a person doing a lack of flight. There, the person went to the bathroom. And also, since it's learning all the time what is being used, it learns that new movements that do not match with previous movement correspond to abnormal activity. Like, for instance, that was an abnormal uh, activity when the person fell down. So, to back up all these algorithms, we have six peer-reviewed papers, uh, a PhD thesis, and inside of these papers, you can uh, find the comparisons with other methods that use other type of sensors. Uh, talking about numbers, the accuracy of our system, we are in the 86% uh, for detecting food. Uh, this is not just food, actually there are 1,000 objects, you can try them in the web page uh, that I mentioned before. And for detecting normal and normal activity, we're uh, within the 96% of accuracy. Uh, how much did it cost the hardware? Uh, well, a, a web, we use any webcam, this one cost $35. The range that you can get them is between $35 and $100. A uh, computer, you can use the one you have, otherwise if you had to buy one, this one is in the range of $300. And this goes in your place, or in the place of the, the elder. And with the conclusions, we are presenting here a scalable system. That means that uh, thanks to using uh, machine learning, more it's used, more it learns, and better it gets. And it can be applied to different domains. We just tried to be vertical today with these two particular applications. Uh, we are very strict with privacy. There's no video. I just use the videos to, for you to believe me that those are the levels corresponding to the video. Uh, the price is uh, relatively low, uh, low. And the more important thing is that uh, we believe that with this kind of technology, we can move forward from this uh, police state where you need to ask a lot of things, and that will improve the quality of living. So thank you very much. Uh, you can visit these two web pages. Uh, for having more information. You will see other type of videos, another type of uh, uh, examples. Thank you so much. We'll have you stay up there. Any questions? Let's see, we'll start in the front here. Is your plan to package this with the hardware and have that sold as a product? What it, ends up being purchased by the end user? Yeah, but. Uh, we can sell the, the, the hardware itself, but we want it to be free of, of uh, uh, the sensors. So we don't want uh, for the people to go and buy a particular sensor. If you have it at your place, even better. You can use your own stuff. If you don't, well, those are the prices we're handling. So during, during your presentation, you brought down activity into normal and abnormal. There must yeah. be sort of finer gradations that you can do. What have you tried and you know, what are the possibilities there? Yeah. Uh, well, actually, I, 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 it was very uh, coarse, normal and abnormal. Uh, actually, the algorithm is hierarchical, so you can detect activities and subactivities. The algorithm works bottom up, where clusters of motion are present, and that matches to activities that were learned before, and the things that are never seen before are going to be uh, triggered as abnormal, until someone says that that corresponds to a normal group. Yeah. So actually, we can handle concurrent activities of different durations and in a hierarchical way. So the uh, technology demonstrated is, is very impressive, but uh, w what is the business model that you're contemplating for commercializing this? We're exploring that thing now, but uh, for the moment it's pay-per-view. Say a little bit more about that? Uh, paying uh, $30 uh, every month uh, to have your statistics and alarm subscription. All right, I'm going to go here and then here and then Victor. Um, do you also have technology to not only recognize the activity, but recognize the person doing the activity? So if you have multiple... For identification. Yeah, we want to stay a little bit... Uh, we can do it. 
we can have face detection and matching and everything. Uh, the thing is, uh, we don't know which are the boundaries with privacy in that case. If there is a particular application for that, yes, we don't want to do publicity of that because uh, there are going to be a lot of complaints. So, object recognition and activity recognition are very different kinds of computer vision and machine learning challenges. Pardon, which which you? Uh, so, object recognition yeah. as compared to activity yeah. recognition are two very different kinds of activities. The morphology of close. objects, a morphology of objects makes that task somewhat easier. But I just want to concentrate on the activity yeah. recognition. That's a very major problem both in the field of computer vision and the field of machine learning. Usually people use a tenfold cross-validation technique where the test set and the training set are the same set. And I wonder whether those results of 96 percent, um, what the, what the, um, the set was. What did okay. you train on? Cr cross-validation is for supervised training here. It's unsupervised. Mm -hmm. uh, so the 96 percent is with five daily living activities. And the model was unsupervisedly learned the patterns. And the labeling was semi-supervised. One label of one of the activities that propagates to the other ones and it was compared to a ground truth, not in, in, in that way. Like cross-validation was done in, within the ground truth with the training samples. Mm -hmm. uh, we want to at some point move forward, uh, move uh, beyond um, uh, any type of configuration. So the object detection is completely unsupervised. There is a paper of CVPR this year um, of a colleague of mine using the same techniques with these convolution neural networks for detecting activities, uh, adding motion to it, because it's the only difference. Okay. And that's the, 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 the way we're moving to. So the reason I ask the question is that the people that you're going to be monitoring have very different morphologies and very different patterns of yeah. movement. So how long would it take for you to be able to train up a system okay. on a particular person? For, okay. It could be months before they get any benefit from no. this. No. Uh, the, the, uh, the training is going to be done at that level of activities. And the next uh, step of the algorithm is all done offline. The training for the object, it took us 10 days. The algorithm has 60 million parameters and was trained with 1,000 objects. With the activities, uh, we have done tra uh, tests uh, between five activities. It's not what's published here. And that takes about 15 days of training, and it can match uh, in another domain. So would the people that this is meant to help have to engage in that training, do those training exercises? No. You, you take other people doing the same thing. That's transferring all the learning. That's uh, where the field is going right now. But you need a lot of GPUs, a lot of computers, and that's what we know more or less how to do. Wow. Okay. One more from Victor in the back. A quick Thanks, one. Thanks, Katie. So uh, related questions. So you get 96% accuracy in, in the moment, I guess, for activity detection. So have you done any field tests, or if not, what would be your estimate about how that translates in practice in the field mm -hmm. to um, the rate of false positives if you're doing fall detection? Because, for example, if you have like a cancer screening test, 96% might seem high. But if the response to a false positive is like, you need to call, you need to go for a visit, mm -hmm. you know, how does that impact the practical? Well, <laughs> in the papers you have, uh, I mean, uh, accuracy is in including false positives. It's a combination of true positive, false positive, and false negative. Uh, but uh, you have in the papers the, the, the real values and the labels and et cetera of uh, the recognition of the activities. Uh, it was mostly with activities such as cooking, uh, uh, the, the translation activities going from one place to the other are quite easy, uh, but the other ones in, involve not just the motion of where the person is located with respect to the environment, which is learned, but also the motion of the different body parts, just to differentiate. Oh, wait, sorry. So we're low on time, but I think you all should we, we sit at the table line. at lunch, and yeah, we have a brain trust table to talk about algorithms. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you.